God's people said. Amen. Amen. Caleb, I just have to say, I'm so proud of you. I don't, um, you know, I, I was thinking I had this moment watching Caleb um, pray this morning that, so this space, Harvest has been around for, I think, over 20 years, but in this space, particularly in this room, uh, 2015 is when Harvest kind of moved out of the sanctuary and, and came in here. And um, the fountain, we, you know, we, we sprinkle, uh, we pour water, but we also immerse. And um, there's an immersion tank. The fountains, as you come out there, are, um, that's, there's an immersion place where you can get baptized out there. And Caleb, uh, eight years ago, uh, was one of the, he was the very first one to ever get baptized in the fountain outside eight years ago. So... To just kind of see him and, and watch what the Lord is doing, it's just the, I just, the goodness of God. Um, and I, shameless plug here, but I know the Lord, I hope the Lord hears my heart. I'm so proud to be a part of a church that just doesn't talk about the importance of our next generation, but like is giving them platforms and places to lead and to live into their calling now. We're not waiting, you know? <laughs> And I'm so, I'm so proud of that. So love, love that he's here. I love that you're here. Um, I, I just, I get the biggest smile on my face whenever I drive onto this campus because I'm always so expectant just to see what the Holy Spirit has in store. So for those of you who are here today, welcome. Thank you. I continue to say thank you for making worship a priority. There's a lot of places you could be. You're here. For those of you that may be watching online today, you may be vacationing. I got a, a text from a friend. He was in Colorado this morning watching online. I love people are, are vacationing over the summer. Uh, my wife and I have a trip planned in a couple of weeks. Um, we have our 30th wedding anniversary this year, and we said we're going to do something uh, that we've never done before. We're we're going to Italy in a couple of weeks. And this is, yeah, this is actually the crazy thing. This kind of blew my mind when I, I didn't realize this. Y'all, this is the first time I have ever been out of the country with my wife that I haven't had church people with me. <laughs> That's a true story. Like it's like Holy Land, which is great, or Greece, Paul's missionary travels, or, you know, mission trips. And y'all, I love church people. Don't, don't hear me wrong, but this is just going to be a different experience. So don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. Um, Pierce, was, uh, Pierce was asking me uh, this week in the hallway at church. He's like, hey, man, you excited about this trip? And I said, let me tell you something, brother. There are two things standing between me and this 30-year anniversary trip to Italy, and it's gluttony and lust. And I am on my way, baby. <laughs> High five. I went back to my office, and I felt the Holy Spirit go, you know, if no one knew that you were talking about a sermon series, that was so uncomfortable for them. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, we are, we are in, this, uh, in this series, The Seven Deadly Sins, and full disclosure, I, you know, I shared this this morning at 9.30 that I was coming into this, I just like, ah, oh, seven weeks on sin, really? Like, who picked this? Who picked this series? Pierce was very quick to remind me I did, which I appreciated, but like, really, I was just like, do you really, sitting and talking about sin for seven weeks, I was a little anxious about it. But I have to say, and I, I can't, I'm not speaking for you, but I can say for me, this has been one of the most convicting and also one of the most life-giving series that I have ever been a part of. I have loved this. And I've heard where it has landed with you as well. Because I honestly, I, I think that, and the realization, the reminder for me is, listen, we don't need to shy away from conversations on sin. We don't. We, I mean, you, you can, you can kind of step around it. It can kind of be the elephant in the room. But the truth is what I find is life is short and sin separates us from our creator. So we need to care about the things that God cares about. And you better believe that God cares about sin. So today we're talking about gluttony. Now, <laughs> hold on. I made a strong case that naps are biblical. So don't think, I'm not saying sins, Oreos. However, for this illustration, I used to, I used to do this with when I did youth ministry uh, 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 many years. And I, I think here's the, here's the thing. That for me, it was like it was important to just kind of bring this in here. Because if, if we're, not, we're not careful, it's cr is it crazy how we justify sin sometimes? It's like, has anybody ever, like, been there? Like, you just kind of justify, you say, okay, um, some sin, well, that's a bad, bad sin. For example, right? So let's stack it up. Seven deadly sins. Here we go. Again, if you work for Oreo, Oreo's not sin. But just for the illustration, that's where I'm going with right now. Right? So, um, 
You know, we, we tend to look at, for example, envy or, or sloth. We talked about envy and sloth. And I mean, you know, if, if your biggest sin is envy, if you carry envy in your life, I mean, if you're looking at this one's the really, really bad one. Well, envy's down here. And it's easy to like go, ah, I mean, come on. It's not the worst sin, right? I mean, you've got like, you know, anger and, and, and pride and you have these other sins. So I, th I think we have to be very, very careful not to rank sin. But this is the world that we live in, right? I mean, remember when Jesus um, in the Sermon on the Mount was, was talking about murder, for example, when I preached on anger, I mean, Jesus said, you have to be very careful. Like some of you, you know, thou shalt not kill. And you're very proud because you look at that one at the very top and you go, oh, yeah, well, I haven't murdered anyone. And Jesus said, but you hold hatred and bitterness in your heart towards someone. So you think you're down here. The truth is, it's the same thing. You're just emotionally murdering people. And it's the same in the eyes of God. So the point of this is just be very careful when you get comfortable with the sin that you have in your life because you say, well, it could be worse. Because the truth is, we look at it this way, this is what God sees. He doesn't see one and say, oh, that's so much worse than the other, so therefore I'm not going to worry about it. No, no, no. The truth is, sin is sin in the eyes of God. And Scripture doesn't shy around, right? Like it says, for the wages of sin is, is death. We, we need to care about the things that God cares about. So today, let's talk gluttony, all right? Let's just jump into it. I never should have done this. <laughs> Sounded so good in my mind. Yeah, somebody's pointing at my teeth. You know what? Sin stains, all right? So let's, sorry, I didn't have breakfast. So here's what I found. In my, um, in my time with gluttony this week, I was actually, uh, transparency, I have so much of this sin in me. And there was such a, a conviction in the midst of this particular word, but yet at the same time, I have also found such a sweetness and such a freedom from the things that I have been choosing to stuff my soul with, but yet the good things that God wants to give me. And that has been my prayer for every one of you. I don't know if you know this, before you even come into the room, one of the sweetest moments, our prayer team, they, they cover the entire space, every seat, cameras. They, they sit back here in the corner in the morning and they pray. Before I ever come up here and preach a word, one of the prayer team members comes, prays over me. So whatever you're carrying in this space today, whatever it is that you have, Whatever it is, if you're, you're watching wherever you are, I want you to know that we have prayed specifically that you would have an powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit today. That the same God who loved the world, that sent Jesus into the world, remember John 3, 17, for he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. This is not condemnation today, but he sent Jesus into the world to save us through him. So there is freedom that's available for us all. So will you just join me in a, in a word of, of prayer? And let's just, uh, let's pick gluttony up today. Let's, let's look at it. Let's see what the word has to say about it. And let's find the freedom that Jesus gives us on the other side of it. Gracious and loving God, I am thankful for this time today. Just a, a breath prayer that emerged this morning in worship is just this. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. So, Father, I, I thank you for just the goodness of who you are, the gentleness of the Holy Spirit that is so present in this room today. So, Lord, I just pray right now for any strongholds that may exist. The same serpent in the garden in Genesis 3 is the same one who worms his way into the garden of our lives to mislead us, to tempt us, to lie to us, to say the things of this earth will sustain and will be more. So, Lord, I just ask today through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would just loosen the grip of the things that we are holding to that maybe the enemy has said this will give you life but we're dying inside loosen the grip lord 
take our hands off of that which will ultimately kill and destroy so that our hands may be open to receive the life-giving word that you have for your children today. More of you, less of me. Comfort the afflicted if necessary. Afflict the comfortable and be given all the glory, all the honor and all the praise. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. God's people said, amen, amen. All right, Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well... We can eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not even touch it or you'll die. And the serpent responded, ha, you will not certainly die for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, listen to the word play here. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, say the word pleasing, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, She took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the moment that God's good and perfect creation was fractured by the temptation of the serpent. Now, I've shared this many sermons back, I think when pride, the very first one, I talked about God's intent for his creation is always Genesis 2. And by the way, he's going to restore it. We're going to get back to Genesis 2 again eventually when Jesus comes back. But his intent was what? Humanity that lived in relationship with one another and with The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right there in the middle. So they're in relationship with one another and they're in relationship with their good heavenly Father who, by the way, in the garden gave them everything that they needed to be sustained. But Genesis 3 comes along and what happens? Is it possible that where you may think the very first sin that we ever find in Scripture was the sin of pride? Is it possible, I think, the very first sin is the sin of gluttony? Why? Because gluttony will always lead you to desire more. It will always lead you to desire for more. Remember, they had everything that they needed, the presence of God, all the food was there, but it always entices you with more. So what's a definition of gluttony? I kind of like to look at the definition and how it's evolved over the ages. Well, gluttony comes from the Latin word gulo, and it actually translates to gulp. So if you've ever gotten a big gulp, is that 7-Eleven? I'm sorry. It's just a big cup of gluttony, apparently. But that's where it comes from, all right? Evagrius Ponticus, the desert father, the one who, where the seven deadly sins kind of originated from, he defined gluttony this way. He said, listen, it is the gateway sin. You indulge gluttony and all of the other sins, pride and envy and anger and lust. He said, you indulge gluttony and it opens the door for all of the other sins. John Cassian um, said it's a lack of temperance or moderation. Now, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, he actually said it's just all about food. He said there's five ways to commit gluttony in your life. Number one, eating food that's too luxurious, exotic, or costly. Aquinas hadn't even been on a cruise at that point, but that's what he said. He said... It's eating food that is excessive in quality, too daintily 
or elaborately prepared. How's that? Like a macaroon? Like, I don't know what to do with that. Eating food that's excessive in quantity, too much. Eating hastily, too soon, or at an inappropriate time, or eating greedily, too eagerly. Of course, this is 13th century, right? And you go back and you think about kings that would have these royal banquets, and they would do these elaborate spreads, these, these spreads, these elaborate tables that were filled with just all kinds of food to overflowing. But what did you find outside the castle, outside the king's gates? You found the peasants who were emaciated, the, the poor, the destitute that didn't have access to food. So is it just about food? Because we tend to make it just about food. I actually think that a better definition is this. It's the desire to go beyond what's necessary. I mean, that's what we saw in Genesis 3. Jeff Cook said this. Gluttony is, first and foremost, excessive. It's a third car when one will do. A third drink when one is best. A third hobby when the other two you have started aren't satisfying enough. Alcoholics, drug users are gluttons, but... So are web surfers, card players, and business people. In other words, a holic is the suffix attached to the glutton's meal of choice. For gluttony is immoderation. And immoderation is not about having body fat. It's about having a gaunt soul. Preaching is so much fun. <laughs> And moderation, how about that, is not about body fat. And moderation is about having a gaunt soul. It's about filling yourself with things that ultimately you think is going to satisfy, but at the end of the day, it just leaves you wanting more, the sin of gluttony. If you have a Bible, um, flip over to Psalms, uh, Psalm 78. There's a, a story um, that you find, you find it in Exodus, you find it in Numbers, and you actually find this story as well in Psalm 78. Maybe you've heard it if you spent any time in church. It's the story of, of Moses, manna, and, and quail, this miracle that God provides. And it, it's really fascinating. It's an amazing story. It talks about the goodness of God, but it also shows when God gets upset with humanity. So the, the story is, right, like the Israelites were, were in captivity and chains and bondage, and, and God sends Moses to go set his people free. So Moses does, and he delivers them, and he gets them, he delivers them by the goodness of God out of the shackles and the chains that they have. So now commentators believe this particular story is anywhere from two weeks to a month into what would be their 40 plus year journey to the promised land. So think if Moses is taking them out of Houston, they're not even out of the Houston city limits when this story happens. So they're on their way and all of a sudden the Israelites begin to whine and they begin to complain. They, they do this a lot. God bless Moses for 40 plus years because it seems like they're just never content or happy. But at the heart of that very first whining moment was they were hungry for food. And that's justified. I mean, they're going through a desert region. So what does God do? He hears their complaining. And the goodness of God provides what the word says is manna. Literally, it was bread from heaven. It came down in a dew and it was flaky. And, and the, the Israelites were able to take that and to make bread. And here's what happens. It sustained them. So they had all the manna that they could eat, bread. It sustained them. It gave them life. There was water that was provided for them. And don't miss this. The presence of God, Genesis 2, the presence of God was right there with his people. And he led them with a pillar of clouds during the day and a pillar of fire at night. God was right there in the midst of them. Now, <clears throat> about a month into this journey, the next thing that happens is they have all this manna. They have all this bread but they start to grumble again. And then all of a sudden it gets a little bit louder and they're complaining a little bit louder and God hears it and God says to Moses, hey, you need to talk to them. What's going on? And Moses talks to them and come to find out the Israelites go, yeah, well, the, I mean, the bread is good. But you know what we really miss? Back in Egypt when we had those chains on us, Man, they had this beef that had some like spices and some stuff on it. And it was like barbecued. It had like a seared edge. I'm making all this up. And in my mind, this is what they're saying. And it was like 
roasted to perfection. Like we just, all this bread, we need some meat. Apparently they were from Texas. They're like, we need meat. We want meat. The meat that we had when we were in chains, we want that meat now. And God's like, okay, you want some meat? I'm gonna give you some meat. So look, Psalm 78, 26. He let loose the east wind from the heavens. And by his power, he made the south wind blow and he rained meat down on them like dust, birds like sand on the seashore. And he made them come down inside their camp all around their tents. So like if you read it in Numbers or even Exodus, you get like bushels in these measurements. There were over a billion quail that descended over the Israelites in the season. And it said like up to three feet. So that just meant that this rogue weird jet stream, God swirled up the atmosphere and these quail got redirected, disoriented, and they're flying about three feet off the ground where the Israelites were. And God said, you want meat? Here's a buffet. Now guess what happens? First off, You don't see any story of them giving thanks to God for the extra provision that he provided. You don't see them building an altar and naming it quail, like that's their Ebenezer, where God provided a barbecue for the people. Nothing. Here's what you see. This is how they react. Verse 29, they ate until they were gorged. He had given them what they craved. But before they turned from what they craved, even while the food was still in their mouths, God's anger rose against them. Why? Because he gave them more and more wasn't enough. And I think the heart of this story, the heart of the story is that God is teaching his people then Can you trust that I am giving you exactly what you need? Like, can I be enough? Now, it's not ironic at all that I'm sitting here studying, and I get in my car, and I hear this news story, July 4th, this past Tuesday, right? Was that July 4th? Anybody uh, know who this guy is? His name is Joey Jaws Chestnut. Ben's laughing. You know who this is. Y'all. They do this every year. It's the hot dog eating contest. Tell me God does not have a sense of humor, right? Like Joey was very intentional. They almost canceled it because of rain, but Joey's like, no, you don't. I've been eating hot dogs and preparing for this moment. So the brother regained his title. He consumed 62 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Now, Look at Joey's face. Is that the face of contentment? Or is that the face that's second guessing everything that he believed? Let me tell you, just because you can, is it necessary? Just because it's there, do you have to consume more and more, and more. Because the truth is, you find this all throughout Scripture where where God is saying, can I be enough? In in Isaiah chapter 55, is, is anyone thirsty? Then come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food? that doesn't give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. God is saying to his people who again are back in Babylonian captivity, do you trust that I am enough? Do you trust that I will meet your needs? Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that The Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Even in John's gospel, 635. My goodness, tapping all the way back to the Israelite story in manna, Jesus would say this, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It's, it's, it's almost Isaiah 55, right? Jesus says, I, I, I am the bread of life. As manna was to the Israelites in abundance and sustaining, so I am, so my body, so my sacrifice is for you. If you're hungry, I'm here. If you're thirsty, I will always satisfy. This is John 4, the woman at the well, right? Who She finds herself there in the middle of the day, and she's drawing water. And Jesus, I don't think it was happenstance. I don't think it was an accident that he bumps into her. I think this is a divine appointment that Jesus had to meet the Samaritan woman. Why? Because she is giving herself over the course of the conversation that they have. She has given herself to man after man after man after man after man. She has jumped into bed after bed, relationship after relationship, thinking that that would satisfy her, but it has left her alone and by a well in the middle of the day, staying away from people. And Jesus says to her, you are drinking from a well that will never satisfy. Yet, I offer you something that will always satisfy. I mean, I, I think we all have a hole. We all have a hole. We were all born with this hole in our, our heart. And it, it's not a bad thing. It's not a terrible thing, right? Scripture says you're fearfully and you're wonderfully made, right? I believe that when you came into this world that, that God anticipated your arrival. I believe we're all here for a purpose. But the thing is, the whole, the intention of that whole was to be filled and to be sustained by our Heavenly Father. But the problem arises... When we replace the goodness of God, the love of the Father, when we replace the teachings of Jesus, the truths of our beloved, and we begin to find our satisfaction in the things that this world offers. And we begin to eat, and we begin to consume, and we begin to buy into the lie that the serpent spread in Genesis 3. Tactics haven't changed. The serpent will always say, one more is always going to make you happy. If it's a million, you need five million. If it's a trip here, you need four more trips here. If it's three cars, five. Like always, the servant says, more is going to make you happy. But the truth is, at the end of the day, we walk around like Joey Chestnut going, why do I feel so upset to my stomach? Because the things of this world, if you look for that to sustain you and complete you, will always go sour. Always. I will never forget watching Jerry Maguire in a crowded theater on a date night with my wife. Do you remember that scene? Tom Cruise busts into the room, looks at Renee Zellweger and says, you complete me. <laughs> and I look around and women were like weeping. <laughs> and I caught, I'll never forget this, and I caught the eye of one dude in the theater and he looked at me like, we are in so much trouble. <laughs> I was like, I know. Mm. <laughs> Y'all, Here's the thing, if I look to my wife, Nikki, to complete me, she's never going to do it, and vice versa. Because the truth is, the only thing, truly, the only thing that satisfies is God. When we find our completion in him, when we just develop that relationship, and we just say, okay, I trust when I say the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, that you're giving me just what I need today, and we grow in that. That's where we find our completion. Philippians chapter 3, there's this moment where the Apostle Paul, Philippians, he was in shackles, and he was literally chained to a guard, and Paul, in the midst of a very difficult circumstance and situation, thinks this is a great opportunity to pen an entire letter to the church of Philippi about joy. Joy. I mean, I'd be writing country and western songs. I mean, I wouldn't be thinking about joy. That's hard. He didn't know if he was going to make it or not. But he writes about joy. Why? Because Paul says, I've learned, 
I've learned the way to be content. I've found contentment in his life. And he says, it's this. I mean, I, I know what it means to have a lot. I know what it means to have nothing. I know what it means to be well fed. I know what it means to be hungry. And in every one of those seasons and circumstances, Paul says, here's my contentment. It's this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't find my joy in what the world gives. So Paul, in the midst of this letter on joy, I've never noticed this before. He begins to weep in chapter 3. And it's not weeping of joy. It's weeping of tears. It's lamenting over people in the world who have lost their way. They're going against who Jesus has called them to be. So Paul says, here's what you do. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have um, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, Paul would define an enemy of the cross of Christ as this. Their destiny is their destruction. They're living for the world, but ultimately it doesn't satisfy. He says their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind, look, is set on earthly things, the more. But Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Paul says just in this little segment of Scripture three things that are important. He says, number one to the church, follow my example. You see the joy that I have right? I've learned to be content. You need to follow this example. We need, by the way, we need good Christian spiritual mentors in our life. Think about your circle. Who are the people that you surround yourself with? We need good Christian mentors in my lives. And you're not following them. Make sure you follow someone who looks like the red letters of Jesus. That's the kind of people that we need to become, right? So Paul says, listen, you need good Christian examples. So he says, follow my lead. But no, you're not following me. You're following Jesus at work in me. But listen, just as you need those people in your life, you may subscribe to those people on Instagram, but you also need to be reminded of this. People subscribe to you. People are watching you. It's a seminary professor. I'll never forget it. I've never been able to shake it. And honestly, I hope I never do. He said, listen, the truth is there are people in this world that may never pick up the Bible and read the red letters, the Gospels of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But here's what I do know. Someone is going to read the Gospel that you are writing with your life. What are you telling them about who Jesus is in your life? Paul says, care about those things that Jesus cares about. Don't look to the world to fulfill you, to sustain you, but instead remember this, our world, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. So there's some questions that I've been sitting with this week as we, as we wrap this. And I, I want to put these on the screen. I would encourage you to take a picture of them. Uh, one thing I always want to do is I want this sermon not to end here in this space, but I, I want it to follow you out the doors. And I think if you took just a couple days on every one of these questions and you journaled, you just prayed, I, would, I have found that God has really revealed a lot of things in me as I've just taken some time to meditate on these. Here's the questions. Number one, what captures my heart? Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what captures your heart? What consumes your hours? That's a dangerous question. I mean, I used to get, how many of you get that? It always comes like 
on Sunday morning when I'm getting up to preach and my phone tells me this is all the time I spend on my phone on social apps. I turn it off. It was too depressing. Probably not a good thing. But pay attention. What consumes your hours? And lastly, this is big. What controls your happiness? Because at the end of the day, I think what Jesus would say is this desire for more, this desire for more, this desire to fill this hole that we have and this unfulfilled feeling that we have. I think the antidote to that, yes, is moderation, but it's just trusting that he is enough. Ultimately, it all boils down to trust. Listen to what Jesus says from someone who has struggled with anxiety, panic attacks most of my life. This is a passage that I return to often, and it just, it felt right here. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. By the way, worry, that word worry, the root definition of it is to be pulled in different directions. Worry literally tears you apart. So he said, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you'll wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? I wrote in the margin of my Bible, have you ever seen a bird with an ulcer? (laughs) I don't think so. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? I mean, since you can't do this very little thing, why do you worry about everything else? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You of little faith. And don't set your heart on what you will eat or what you will drink. Don't invest in that. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. So here's what we do. Seek his kingdom. Matthew and his righteousness. And Jesus said, all these things will be added to you. But this verse hit me differently this week. 33. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Those things that I pursue. Those things that I I chase after in public and in private that I think will define me, will fulfill me. At the end of the day, hear this, you are enough. You are. It pleases the Father. The Father delights in giving you the kingdom. So whatever it is, that thing, you know what that thing is, the Holy Spirit has been telling you, that has left you empty, that has left you unfulfilled, there is someone in this space right now, and you have more than you have ever had before in your life, but you are also unhappier than you have ever been in your life, and you're going, is this it? The Lord's looking at you today, and he's saying, no, there's so much more. Loosen the grip. Hands open. Trust him. Would you stand? I want to pray over us. And I just, um, we don't do this all the time, but I I love it when we do. So just open your hands. Palms up right in front of you. I like to say on the Pentecostal scale, this is a solid two. It's not, not high. We can do this. Methodists, we can do this. But it's just a posture of saying, 
Lord, I'm ready to receive what you have. It's the posture that you take when we have Holy Communion. When you receive the body and you take the cup, you come with empty hands. You don't come with anything in your hands. They're empty and they're open. And I think we need to carry this posture more than on just the first Sunday of the month. So let me pray for us now. Father, hmm. I just sense such a sweetness in this space. I sense a, a brokenness in the room. I sense someone, Father, who just, they are broken this morning. But it's, it's not a bad broken. It's just a, a brokenness of, yeah, that bottle's not going to do it anymore. Whatever that aholic is that we've been giving ourselves to, there's a realization that there has to be more. So, Jesus, I thank you for the good news. I thank you that you are the bread of life, that those who come to you will never thirst for you are enough. It doesn't take hardships out of the world. It doesn't mean that things are always going to be easy. We live in a broken world, but it reminds us our identity is you, that you are our beloved. Father, I just pray right now we would get an image of you, Jesus, in our minds, that we would just see you, picture you. And you don't sneer, you don't look at us as a disappointment. You don't shake your head. But Father, when you see us in these moments, when we slow down enough to look at you in your eyes, you smile. And you say, I've got it. I've got you. Trust me. Trust me. Lord, I pray for the heart today in this room that's never given their lives to you. That has to be where it starts. It has to start with a confession. Lord, that no sin that we bring to the altar scares you. But we have to start with the realization that Jesus, you are who you say you are. I pray if there is someone that needs to give their lives to you, that, Father, they would just move forward in this time. They don't have to understand it. And God, I pray for addictions, for strongholds. I pray for the more that has been void of you. That, Lord, people would just, we would come, fall on our knees, be prayed for, and be reminded that we are not alone. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you have in store. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we say amen.